Well, good evening and welcome to Friday Fellowship. I'm so glad for every one of you who is here with us, either live tonight or watching this recorded. Uh, thanks to the short semester, we are already on the final stretch. This is it. I know many of you have been working very hard right now to finish projects and papers before Thanksgiving break. So I want to say to you all, keep up the good work. You're almost there. But as we gather tonight, let's take a moment to put down the burdens and the worries that we've been carrying this whole week. Relax your shoulders, take a deep breath, and remember the opening words from Psalm 23, which reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Let's take a moment to settle ourselves into the green pasture of God's presence together. Hi everyone, welcome to Claremont Christian Fellowship. We are so glad that you are here and our community is a welcoming space for people from any walk of life or any stages of faith. It's it's really, really crazy to think that this is the last Friday Fellowship of 2020 this semester. Feels like it's gone by like all at once. Um, and I, for one, was not ready at all. But I'm grateful for the fact that we've all stayed in touch, like somewhat, throughout the semester and been able to be there for each other. So my name is Thumum. I'm a senior at Pomona, and I use she/her pronouns. And I will be our MC for tonight. And so the here are the announcements. So the first announcement is the post CCF hangout. We will be hanging out over Zoom after fellowship to be with one another and enjoy each other's presence and just kind of de-stress from the week and um, the link to that will be in the messenger chat and also is already on the Facebook group and so if you would like to be added both to the chat and the Facebook group please let us know and please come hang out afterwards. Um, the second announcement is the weekly workouts with Matt. Um, these are a really fun time for for anybody in the community to come together and you know do a bunch of push-ups and stuff and barbies and you know sweat together and be in community together and this is really an encouraging space so um don't be afraid if it's your first time to, to just hop on or if you've been there a hundred times too just to come and be and get swole for jesus as Raul would say um and the third announcement is a virtual christmas party and that will be on uh I'm sorry, I can't speak. 11th of December, um, which is exactly a week after the final day of classes. And so that will be a great time to just be with one another and kind of be post-semester, post-stress and spend time with one another and have fun. Um, I will be on the plane on that day, but everybody should go. And yeah, so that's all the announcements and we will be doing meet and greet now. Um, so the prompt for this week is, what is one thing that you're excited to be doing over winter break? Um, for me, it's I'll be going home to Ethiopia um, and I'm really excited to see my family. And so please put your name and your school and your year, as well as the thing you're excited to do in the in the comments. And yeah, thank you for being here today.
All right, tonight we are wrapping up our semester and our talk series, Practices for Self-Quarantines. It has been an amazing series as we've talked about mental health, prayer, rest, and academics. Tonight, we're going to end on a strong note as we hear from our very own Sagrika Jawadi. Sagrika co-leads the Scripps Community Group for CCF and also serves on CCF's executive team. If you are up for it, you might want to have a paper and a pen handy or your phone so you can take notes because her talk is just packed with truth and helpful ideas. Let's turn it over to Sagrika. Hi everyone, my name is Sagrika. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior at Scripps. I am so excited to be speaking to you all tonight. Are the slides? Okay, cool. Um, so most people who know me would say I'm a pretty disciplined and high achieving person. And I used to identify with that a lot. I felt like if there's one thing no one can take away from me, it's my work ethic, and I prided myself in that. This reached its peak during my sophomore year at Scripps, when no matter how much I was doing, I kept feeling a need to do even more. I was way beyond capacity, working at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders 15 hours a week, which included seven hour shifts on Saturdays, volunteering in a research lab, being a sponsor for the Asian American Sponsor Program, doing tech for CCF, Oh, and taking OCHEM. I never had time for my friends and my anxiety was at an all time high, but I still felt like it wasn't enough. It was almost like the more I did, the worse I felt, but the only thing I wanted to do to feel better was pile on even more stuff. Maybe if I just help with one more event, I'll finally feel satisfied with myself. Maybe if I study for just two more hours, I'll finally feel confident for my exam. Just reach out to one more person and I'll finally feel like a supportive friend. Nothing ever felt good enough. I couldn't meet my high expectations, but I was running myself to the ground trying. I suspect that many of you as students and alumni of the Claremont Colleges can relate to my experience. A big part of why I didn't question the healthiness or sustainability of what I was doing was because I saw it modeled all around me. One of the first things I noticed about Claremont students is how much people were doing and how they made sure to let everyone know. The typical answer to how are you was, ugh, super busy. I had three meetings today, two events, and a test to study for tomorrow. I myself started to love the gasps of awe I would hear when sharing how much I was doing. Overworking, overachieving, and being super hard on ourselves are normalized in Claremont culture. Even the pandemic didn't stop productivity culture. I remember feeling so much pressure in March to try a million new things like pick up two new hobbies, read a book a day, and start a podcast. So how do we resist this pressure? Tonight, I want to talk about self-compassion, a radical, countercultural, and biblical way of being. Self-compassion is basically what it sounds like showing kindness and understanding to ourselves in the same way that we would to a close friend or a loved one. I wanna share with you tonight how we can begin to treat ourselves kindly and why this is important. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce some of the main components of self-compassion and how it's practiced. So the first step towards self-compassion is acknowledging our suffering. And by that, I mean acknowledging when things aren't okay. Suffering is a part of the human condition and it's something all of us experience. We know that life isn't always perfect and happy. And suffering is also a prominent theme in the Bible. Jesus himself acknowledged his own suffering. When he was about to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus openly shared the deep sadness he was feeling with his disciples. Yet I have often said that I'm okay when I wasn't. I have pushed my stress and sadness to the side so that I could keep doing my schoolwork. 
Our culture does not make it easy to talk about suffering. Sadness is a very stigmatized emotion. We're constantly told to look on the bright side and try not to think about the hard stuff. So when we're going through a hard time, we keep it to ourselves. Our culture has convinced us that when we suffer, we've done something wrong, that something abnormal has occurred. Even though Jesus suffered greatly, I somehow think if I try harder, I can escape it. I think if I'm just harder on myself, I'll be more disciplined and then I won't suffer anymore. Do you, do you relate to this? Let's talk about failure. No one likes to fail. We try to be perfect to avoid suffering because failure is a type of suffering. When we fail, that disappointment hurts and we suffer. But instead of showing compassion to ourselves and acknowledging that we're suffering, we often say things like, you suck, you should have tried harder, or I can't believe you're so dumb, which just amplifies our pain when we're already hurting from failing. Isn't that sad? At the moment we need the most kindness, we're the most harsh on ourselves. Think for a moment. How do you tend to speak to yourself when you fail at something? Take a moment to try and identify how you tend to speak to yourself when you fail. Even though as Christians, we know we're imperfect and we know we'll make mistakes, we are still so hard on ourselves when they happen. It's almost like we think we're capable of perfection and we're just not trying hard enough. What other explanation could there be for the ways we berate and deprive ourselves when we fail? Is this a rational response to something that is a normal, universal, and not to mention painful fact of life? What if we treated ourselves with the same kind of compassion we show to others when they fail? What do you tend to say to a friend when they failed at something? Maybe you'd say, I'm so sorry, that's really disappointing. I know you tried really hard. We would never say, this is all your fault. You're so lazy and disorganized. That would be extremely hurtful. And yet we have no reservations about saying these words to ourselves. Friends, if this year has taught us anything, it's that suffering is unavoidable. So let's turn towards it with compassion instead of repressing it or demeaning ourselves. So after we acknowledge our suffering, the next step is showing compassion. We know that we are called to show compassion to others in their suffering and failures, just as God has. A central exhortation of Christianity is to love one another with the same radical, unconditional love God has shown us. This means loving those around us even at their worst and loving more than we judge or criticize. This means accepting all aspects of people, including their imperfections and the things they're most ashamed of. God does this. God accepts us for all of us, all of our mistakes, regrets, and failures. Romans 15, seven states, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. So if we're supposed to show this compassion to everyone around us, and God has shown this compassion to us, wouldn't it only make sense that we're supposed to show this compassion to ourselves? After all, how can we accept others' flaws if we can't even do that for ourselves? As iconic drag queen RuPaul says, if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? We must show compassion and unconditional love to ourselves, just as we do with others. Just as we don't condition our love for our loved ones on anything, we shouldn't condition our own self-worth on our performance, our perfection, or any other trait. This is the one key point we need to understand about self-compassion. It's unconditional. Our self-worth doesn't have to change in response to failure. We can continue to value ourselves just as much because failure doesn't determine our self-worth. When our self-worth is conditional 
we'll always be tempted to downplay or ignore our shortcomings because they're threats to our self-esteem. But if we don't condition our value on our own self-evaluations, then we create a safe space to look at ourselves honestly and accept ourselves as we are. This is how self-compassion makes self-acceptance possible. It creates a safe space to cope with failure and the suffering that comes with it. We know our needs best and we are the most equipped to meet them for ourselves. Have you ever thought about it that way? No one knows your needs better than you. And the more compassion we show to ourselves in our most vulnerable and disappointing moments, the closer we come to self-acceptance. Self-acceptance is completely unconditional self-worth, where we can embrace our deepest insecurities, acknowledge our biggest regrets, and allow and accept every aspect of ourselves. What's more, self-compassion and self-acceptance allow us to access God's love. The more we learn about our flaws, the more we understand the depth of God's love for us and the power of love. God created us with the capacity to love not just others, but also ourselves. And when we practice self-compassion, we are experiencing God's love through ourselves. And when we practice self-acceptance, we're getting one step closer to seeing ourselves the way God sees us. Let me say that again. When we practice self-acceptance, we're getting one step closer to seeing ourselves the way God sees us. We live free from the emotional burden that comes with self-criticism and self-hatred, and we don't exist in constant pursuit of external validation or constant fear of rejection because we know that we are loved and accepted by God. And we get to experience this and really feel and understand this tangibly through ourselves through self-compassion and self-acceptance. So now I know that the topic of self-compassion is not often talked about in Christian circles. So let me address a concern that some people might have about it. A concern that some may have is that self-compassion is selfless, selfish, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> let me say that again. A concern that some may have is that self-compassion is selfish. At first, it may seem like self-compassion is solely for your own benefit, and when you practice it, you're only benefiting yourself. But this isn't the case. Just as self-compassion allows us to understand God's love for us, it also provides deeper insight into how to love others. Our capacity to love others is correlated with the amount of love we show ourselves. They go hand in hand. On one hand, we can begin to learn how to practice self-compassion by looking at how we love others. On the other, we'll have a much greater capacity for grace towards others when we've already shown it to ourselves. We must know, accept, value, and understand ourselves in order to do so for others. Self-compassion and self-acceptance unavoidably flow past ourselves. They naturally overflow into our interactions with others. The healing that comes from self-compassion is holistic and relational. Its benefits don't stop at the person practicing it. They're for your community and your loved ones just as much as they are for you. Also, on a similar note, it's natural to think that self-compassion seems indulgent, like something we only do when we really need it or when we want to treat ourselves. This couldn't be farther from the truth. Unlike many things in our world, which are only good in moderation, self-compassion has no limits. The more compassion we show to ourselves, the better. Self-compassion is not self-indulgence, and it's not solely pleasure-seeking. Self-compassion is having good will toward ourselves. In any context, we can always show ourselves self-compassion. So, how can we put self-compassion into practice and... What does that look like tangibly? This is gonna look different for everyone in every situation. What's working for you might not work for someone else, and what's working for you right now might not in a few months. That's completely normal. You know what you need best. 
And this is also something you can bring to God and get input from your friends about. These are some general tips and examples that I have found helpful, but there are plenty of other things out there that could be helpful for you too. But before I share these tips with you, I want to emphasize that this is an ongoing process and it takes a lot of work. It can also feel very strange at first. For those of us who hold trauma in our bodies, it can be overwhelmingly painful to realize how much we're suffering. So take this slow. You have your entire lives to learn it. So go at whatever pace works for you. Part of self-compassion is being gentle and patient with ourselves as we learn. It takes time to retrain our brain to be kinder to ourselves. I have been actively working on self-compassion since March when I first learned about it, and I'm still working to change some of my negative thought habits. This will take time and you'll mess up, but like any skill with practice, it'll get easier. So let me start with some general principles that we can apply. First, acknowledge when things are hard and don't add to your suffering by being hard on yourself in those moments. Show comfort to yourself in times of distress or failure. This can be hard, but especially impactful during mental health crises like depression, where guilt is often a major component and it's easy to blame oneself. This is why changing our thoughts in those moments and deciding to be kind can have a very powerful impact. We deserve healing and whatever self-care is needed in that moment. Show kindness to yourself by reaching out to someone, journaling, listening to music, cooking slash eating good food, or even just sleeping. Second, set achievable goals for yourself instead of lofty, unrealistic ones. This allows us to actually meet our expectations and celebrate our accomplishments. Part of self-compassion is accepting what we're realistically capable of and creating space to be satisfied with and reward ourselves for the work we've done. And remember, there is no minimum amount of suffering you need to be going through to do self-compassion. It can be done even when you're feeling awesome. You always deserve self-compassion. So now that I've covered those general principles, let me share a few practical examples of how I've been learning to practice self-compassion. As some of you know, this summer, I took the MCAT and I could not have gotten through it without self-compassion. I could have easily just thrown myself into studying and used my classic disciplinary techniques as I usually do to cope with stressors outside of academics. This was also a super important test and I was already in a vulnerable state of mind. So I knew that it would be very easy for me to spiral into panic and feel like it was impossible for me to do well on this test. I knew I needed to use this test as an opportunity to put self-compassion into practice. So first, as a daily practice, I started journaling self-compassionate affirmations to myself. I would take just less than five minutes and write, you're doing great. Whatever you're doing is enough. And sometimes I would also acknowledge my suffering and write to myself like I would write to a friend and say, I'm really sorry that you're super stressed and tired today. That really, really sucks. And even though it didn't change my circumstances, I felt so much support from myself that it really increased my motivation and ability to take on the tasks I had. I learned a similar daily practice from Theo Lang, who's a Pomona alumnus currently at U Chicago School of Medicine. He told me that when he was studying, he would look in the mirror every day and tell himself that he's intelligent and capable of doing well on the MCAT. So I tried it out. And every morning after brushing my teeth and washing my face, I look in the mirror and I tell myself that I'm doing enough and that all the work I'm putting in is enough and I will do well on this test. This definitely felt a little weird at first, not only because it's kind of awkward, but also because I was saying things that were the complete opposite of how I felt. I definitely did not feel like I was doing enough, and I felt like saying I was gonna do well would jinx me. But after literally only a week of doing this for 30 seconds every morning, I felt so much more confident and calm than I've ever felt about a test. It was honestly amazing and unbelievable how fast it worked. 
And it was really empowering to intentionally envision my success and consciously root for myself, which was something I had never done before. This might feel weird, but since we're all at home, I want to give us an opportunity to try this out. So if you're near a mirror, feel free to look into it. But if not, just take a moment and say some kind words to yourself. If you were your friend, what would you say to you right now? Hopefully that was a good experience for you. Another thing I did, which was really fun, was I sent weekly emails to myself. In those emails, I went through what happened that week, how I was feeling, what I was happy about, what I was nervous about, etc. And I would conclude each email with affirmations and validation that what I'm going through is really difficult and that I'm doing the best I can and I'm doing really great. I think the thing I loved most about this was the new feeling of stability that I got. Like I knew I could 100% rely on someone to show me love and I didn't have to explain what was going on and I'd still hear exactly what I needed to hear in that moment. So basically what I'm trying to say through the story is develop a consistent rhythm of expressing nice things to yourself in some way. This could be written or verbal affirmations or something else entirely. Like for example, creating something for yourself like a meal or some kind of art piece and the key here is to start as small as you need to and just build from there. Another vital application of self-compassion that I practiced while studying for the MCAT was establishing boundaries. Before she graduated, Erin Delaney taught me and the rest of CCF a lot about rest. Rest is a necessary and powerful form of self-compassion. I could not have made it through these past eight months without boundaries and rest. How I put this in practice while I was studying for the MCAT was I would force myself, and for those of you who know me, this wasn't easy, to not do work on Saturdays. And I would generally take the rest of the day off after studying for five to six hours in the morning, since all I was doing that summer was studying. It was a huge shift from the way I functioned sophomore year, and it allowed me to take care of myself during a very tough summer. Also, I was flexible with my boundaries. Some days I was tired in the morning, so instead of forcing myself to study in the morning, because I always do and I have to, I would just do as much as I could and then take a break and come back later. And sometimes I would just do much less than I planned and kind of skip the day altogether. And it all worked out in the end. I tried my best to study from a place of rest instead of resting from studying. And this took a lot of self-compassion and acceptance of how much work I was actually capable of doing in a day to create and enforce these boundaries so that I could prevent overexerting myself. And I was definitely not perfect at it. And that's okay because I didn't have to be perfect for it to have a really beneficial impact on me. Also, as I was writing this talk, I realized we have a perfect example of what self-compassion looks like in one of CCF's very own weekly events, Matt's workout. Matt's workouts are brutal, to put it lightly. After the last workout I went to, I could barely move my legs for the next two days. These workouts are hard, but people keep coming and we push ourselves at these workouts. How? Because during the workout, Matt is letting out an almost nonstop stream of affirmation and motivation. He's like, you guys are doing great. You're amazing. It's practically impossible to give up with Matt constantly cheering us on. And also something that I had never experienced in a workout before is how much Matt encourages modifications to the exercises. This creates a space where meeting ourselves where we're at is celebrated and we could be proud for caring for our bodies by not pushing them past their limits. I push myself in Matt's workouts because I feel accepted and affirmed in that space. So another way to practice self-compassion is to find sources of encouragement and positivity that help motivate you to push yourself in a loving and healthy way. My last application is meditation. I recently completed a Headspace meditation course called Kindness. It's a 10 session course of meditations to help practice showing kindness to yourself. 
I recommend checking it out if you have access to Headspace. I'm sure there are also similar things on other apps and there's plenty of stuff online. I have found this practice very healing for deeper emotional trauma and sadness. So to end, I really wanna encourage you all to consider incorporating self-compassion into your daily rhythms, especially as we go into finals. And I'll say this again, it doesn't have to be one of the things I suggested, although those may be good starting points if you're stuck on where to begin. Maybe you're already practicing some form of this, and that's awesome, keep it up. As you can probably tell by my own practices, my primary love language is words of affirmation. However, if that's not true for you, then other forms of self-compassion that align with your love language would probably work better for you. Like, for example, giving yourself a hug as a form of showing love through physical touch. Like most things that are good for us, practicing self-compassion is not always super convenient, but it's definitely worth it, not only for your own well-being, but also for the well-being of those around you. For this talk, I found a lot of my information from Dr. Kristen Neff, who's a professor at UT Austin and has done extensive research regarding self-compassion. She has a website dedicated to self-compassion called selfcompassion.org. Thank you so much for the privilege of being able to share about this topic that means a lot to me personally. Please feel free to reach out for more information, resources, support, or to talk about anything at all. So to end and respond to this talk, I thought it would be fitting to do a loving kindness meditation together that I found on YouTube. Find a comfortable place to sit or lie down with your palms facing up. We begin with a slow, long, deep breath, inhaling and exhaling. On the inhale, we feel our breath filling up and expanding our insides. On the exhale, we feel the breath releasing and we let go of all stress, worry, or concerns. Choosing this time just for you to become present with you. As you take another breath in, feel your body relax and let go. Exhaling away any stress or thoughts that take you out of this moment. On the next breath in, we breathe in the energy of love. See this as a beautiful white or golden light. See this light come in with your breath and illuminate every cell in your body. Notice your body relaxing even more as your body fills up with this beautiful light. On the exhale, we release any obstacles, any thoughts that we may have that make us feel doubt, unworthy of this light, like we don't deserve, don't matter, self-hatred, or any other thought you may be having that blocks this love. Let it go now on the exhale. Remembering that you're in charge, you get to choose what stays and what goes. 
Allow your body to continue to fill up with this magnificent light. Notice each cell in your body beaming with this white golden light. As you look closely at each cell, you see each cell smiling back at you as it's filled with joy. This makes you smile. Allow yourself to smile now. Feel the joy that is coming up through your being. Feel the expansiveness of this energy in your body. You are worthy of this love. You deserve this love. You don't have to do anything to receive this love. Just be open to it as it's always there for you. It is yours. Any other belief is an illusion from the mind. For you are love and only love. Continue to breathe in and out. Bask in this light. Notice this light now extends beyond your physical body. Allow it to continue to expand as much as it wants. Feel it as you watch it expand more and more outside of your body, breathing in and breathing out. This light is who you really are, only love, nothing else, let it in it is yours. You are love. All right. Well, well uh, thank you so much for that, Sigrika. That was really beautiful and significant. Um, I wonder if anybody is still listening at this point or if half of you are passed out in a state of total relaxation and self-compassion. <laughs> um, I want to say a couple of things off of this message. I've had um, a little while to be thinking about Sigrika's words because I had the privilege to be able to look at her, an early version of her message and it's really stuck in my head this whole week. Uh, you know, um, I don't know if many of you have blocks against this message of self-affirmation and compassion. Uh, one thing I realized when she was talking about this concept of, of um, speaking good words to yourself, right, like um, uh, was that I had this obstacle to that, um, of associating that with stuff that's very like maybe not Christian or something. Like um, there was this old Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live sketch um, called um, Daily Affirmations with uh, Stuart Smalley, I think. Um, and it always, he would be looking in the mirror and talking and it would always end with him saying like, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. Um, and it really made the whole thing seem very silly. And um, so I realized when I was reading Sigrika's message that it's like, I've never really considered this very seriously for myself. And I certainly haven't engaged in it, except that I engage in self-talk all the time. It's just mostly negative. Um, and so the things that she was saying uh, really resonated with me, the kinds of messages we speak to ourselves, maybe they resonated with you as well. Um, and as I think about my own life, there have been a few times where I did exercises like where I was doing a reflection in my journal or something, and I tried writing what I thought God's message to me in a particular moment might be. 
And it was always this incredibly powerful thing to hear, to be writing in my own hand these kind words of blessing and acceptance um, that went in just really deeply. Uh, that's consistent with the God we believe in. Of course, we believe we fail. Of course, we believe we sin um, and do things wrong. But those things don't define us. We are defined by God's love and a God who has set us free and accepted us. Um, and so why aren't we receiving and teaching ourselves those messages? So I so appreciate your talk, Sagrika. It's beautiful. And one of my takeaways, and I'm planning on practicing this over the winter break, is to be doing... Um, uh, to be affirming myself and speaking words to myself. There's a few areas of my life where I especially need to hear it. And so I intend to make sure that I hear those words and not just the words of denigration. Um, those are evil words. The denigrating words are evil words. They are not from God. And um, I want to replace them with something good. I want to invite you now to reflect for yourself. I have a couple of questions here I'm putting up. Um, the first is, in what ways are you not compassionate with yourself? And secondly, what is one thing you would like to apply from Sigrika's talk? It could be sort of the, the helpful self-talk. It could be the rest. It could be any of the things she presented us with. It could be that video she shared and doing those kinds of um, loving kindness meditations um, for yourself. Whatever it is, I'd like you to think about that. And as we take some time to reflect on those things, we have um, a response song shared with us by Daniel Park, which he put in the time to make for us. And so... Um, I'm going to throw that on in just a second as we reflect um, and we can receive from him. And at some point, as you finish reflecting and maybe in the middle of the song, you feel ready, why don't you go ahead and post, if you feel comfortable, post something that you want to take away from this, some way you want to live it out or practice it in your own life.
I muted myself. Wow, thank you, Sabrika, for that really amazing talk. Um, similar to Chris, I, I'm, I was really struck by the idea that we are able to show so much compassion to our friends and family and be kind to them in moments of failure, but then fail to do that for ourselves. Um, so that's definitely something I'm going to be kind of looking out and paying attention to um, when I do that for myself in order to reverse it and yeah, give myself the kind words that I think I am, it's easier for me to give to other people. So thank you, Sagrika, for that reminder, especially as we go into finals and when it's going to be so easy to be really stressed and kind of hard on ourselves. So thank you, everybody, for coming to CCF um, and to Friday Fellowship. Please come to the Zoom Hangout afterwards. Um, yeah, and thank you for joining us tonight.